Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to United Lutheran Church. We are so glad that all of you are here to worship with us on this beautiful day that the Lord has made, that we're going to rejoice and be glad. And amen? amen. All right. Um, before we get uh, into it, uh, just a few announcements. I'll direct your attention to the back of your bulletin. Um, first of all, you guys all know what today is. Uh, it's Father's Day, right? It's where we celebrate our, our dads, our earthly fathers, um, the blessing that they are to all of us. And so, to all of you dads out there, it's your day. Uh, make everybody work for you. No. <laughs> anyway, um, so happy Father's Day to all of you out there. Um, anyway, so that is, that's, that's first thing. You know what else today is? Uh, today is uh, the, the day of the Lord, and it's the, the day of the, the week where VBS starts. VBS actually starts tomorrow night, but it's going to be great. We're going to have, uh, well, twice as many or more than twice as many kids as we had last year, so that'll be a good time for all concerned. We've got a good program that's going to be focused entirely on the person of Jesus Christ, so, so pray for that. If you're volunteering, um, thank you, and, uh, you know, if there are, are needs or if you feel led to kind of help out, let Nicole know because, you know, there's always room for one more in this case. So it's going to be a good week. Let's pray that the kids will, will definitely have uh, the week of their lives and that they will meet the Lord and Savior right here where He has called them to be. Uh, also, in the social hall, there are uh, cherries. There are a couple different individuals in the congregation that brought uh, some wonderful cherries. However, they do have a short shelf life, and uh, we are inundated with them. So if you would like some of those, uh, they are available to anyone who wants. Uh, they're in the kitchen, and so after the service, not during the sermon, if you would like to go over and peruse those cherries and, and see, uh, see if they're, they're of interest to you, please, uh, we have bags, take them home and enjoy them with you, uh, your friends and family, okay? All right. Um, uh, let's see here. Other than that, I don't have any other pressing uh, announcements to make. There are some more in the back of your bulletin, but uh, you guys can read those. So... With that, um, if there are no announcements from the floor, we're going to stand and come before our Lord and worship. We open our service this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Almighty and everlasting God, we bow before you in repentance for our sins, we have sinned against you in many ways, most of which are unknown even to us. Forgive us for bad attitudes that offend you, for remarks that hurt you and others, for not following your word and spirit as they try to lead us. Forgive us for those times we have forgotten to call upon you and us to live our lives in the way that will please you. This we pray, thanking you for your great love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. If this be your sincere confession, and if with penitent hearts you earnestly desire the forgiveness of your sins for the sake of Jesus Christ, God, according to His promise, forgives you all your sins. And by the authority of God's Word and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you that God has forgiven all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing our opening hymn this morning, number 453, Take My Life and Let It Be.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the Feast of Victory for our God. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, in the word of your apostles and prophets, you have proclaimed to us your saving will. Grant us faith to believe your promises that we may receive eternal salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson is from Exodus chapter 19, verses 2 through 8, which can be found on page 116 in your pew Bible. Exodus 19 beginning at verse 2. After they set out from Riphon, they re entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my commandment, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Here ends our first lesson. We will read responsively Psalm 100, which can be found on page 937 of your pew Bible. Psalm 100. Shout for the Lord. 
Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Know that the Lord is God. If he, it is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. We give thanks to him for praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Our New Testament lesson will be in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 15. And that can be found on page 1753 in your pew Bible. Romans 5, beginning at verse 6. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like trespass, for if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Here ends our gospel lesson. Please rise for today's reading. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the ninth and 10th chapters. Our Gospel lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, and continues through chapter 10, verse 8. Uh, that can be found on page uh, 1510 in your pew Bibles. Reading in Jesus' name. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out, his, send out workers into his harvest field. He called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles, first Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, the son of De Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel, and as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. This is the gospel of our Lord. The 
The congregation may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word and your word is truth. We pray this morning that you would sanctify us in that truth, that you would use it to convict us of sin in our lives where that is necessary, that you would continue to teach us to trust in you and the promises that you have made to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, even more, even when it's difficult, even when we have doubts, Lord, teach us to trust in you for all things and give us perseverance in faith until at the last you call us home or you yourself return in glory. We pray it in Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Well, this morning we're going to look at our Old Testament lesson in Exodus 19, and we've got some ground to cover, but that's okay. Uh, in the timeline, as far as the Exodus is concerned, we find the Israelites here in our text about three months after the Red Sea crossing out in the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. And they've made their camp at the foot of the mountain of God, uh, what we know as Mount Sinai, which is in a range of mountains called the mountains of Horeb. And so sometimes you'll see those names Sinai and Horeb sort of used interchangeably. But they are at the mountain of God where the Ten Commandments would be given uh, in the chapter which follows uh, this one. And what we have is the entrance uh, or the, the introduction of God uh, of His law to His people. And it's been an eventful several months that have brought the Israelites here to this place to receive God's law to become part of His covenant. They've witnessed God's might and power on display in the plagues in the Passover back in Egypt. They stood and they watched as God accomplished their salvation and victory at the Red Sea crossing. And then they watched as the fleeing Egyptians were destroyed by the waters as they were covered over. That the people have also had to deal with the other side of things. On one side you have God, but on the other side you have sin. And the people have been dealing with their own sin since the Red Sea. They've doubted God's provision for them. And then they experienced His mercy and provision in the water and later in the manna and quail. They doubted God's intention and His desire for their well-being. And they displeased the Lord because they not only grumbled against Him, but they grumbled against His leaders, Moses and his brother Aaron. God's people were taught to honor the Sabbath, and then they proceeded once again to go right back into arguing with Moses about water, even though they had seen all of these things. They had witnessed yet another miracle of God when they saw water coming from the rock which Moses struck. Even as they continued to doubt God's desire for their life and well-being. And so here, God's sinful people have come to the base of Mount Sinai where they are camped. And God called Moses up to the mountain in verse 3 of our text. And uh, the conversation between God and Moses is what forms the, the basis of uh, our text this morning and what we're going to discuss. And we see three things uh, that we're going to talk about. Uh, three things that God has, or I should say two things God has and one thing that uh, we respond with. First thing, a reminder to each and every one of us that God has delivered His people. Secondly, there is God's desire that His people would be part of His holy kingdom and live by His commands. And then last, there's the people's response. We see it in, at the end of the text where the people say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses tells all of the things that God instructed him to do, and the people said, we will do. And so the theme that really ties all of these things together is that God's people need to know Him, that they need to trust in His plan for their lives and act on the faith that He has wrought in them. In other words, don't just sit idle, act, move, and do. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. First question to ask is, what did these things mean for God's people Israel? We see the first idea in the text in verse 4, that God has delivered His people. There's a reminder 
about what God had accomplished on the people's behalf, the deliverance He won for them, expediently bringing them out of the bondage of the Egyptians. And did the people need a reminder? Absolutely, yes, they did, because they doubted the Lord all the way through uh, the Exodus, and they consistently complained that their life of slavery in Egypt was better than what they had now. They needed to be told again and again about how things really were. And the Lord says to them, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, reminding them of the miracles that he had worked, the plagues that he had sent, how he had broken Pharaoh and the Egyptian people and destroyed the army. They have seen the power of the Almighty, and they have been delivered by him alone. They walked across dry ground at the Red Sea. They got water that was sweet because God took what was bitter and transformed it. They received manna and quail as gifts of the Almighty. And it's important for us to remember that in this deliverance that God gave to His people, there was no work for the Israelites. There were no battles to be fought and won. There was no earth moving for them to do. There were no seas to dry up and calm. No waves to make and crash over the Egyptians to destroy the army. No food to procure. God did it all. In Exodus 14, Moses tells the people, even in their doubt, right before they cross uh, the Red Sea, he says, fear not, stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. There was nothing for God's people to do but to let Him deliver them and to follow after Him. The Lord Himself saved His people, and here He reminds them of that deliverance and that they have seen and they know His awesome power, which they would see more of as the years went on. They've also heard His call, that they are His chosen people. It begins even back in Exodus 6, where God says, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from their bondage. God was already telling them that they were going to be His people, that they were His, and that they would know it and yet they still doubted it. And that's kind of the second idea of this uh, lesson this morning we see in the text, that God reminds His people that they have been chosen to be His. That's verses 5 and 6. God tells them that they are His treasured possession and that they have been made His, and he wants to have his, He wants to make His covenant with them. And that covenant is what we know as the Mosaic Covenant, or we call it the law sometimes, which they placed themselves under. But that covenant came with a stipulation, and you see it. Um, The people had to obey His commandments and law, thereby keeping the covenant. It's what's known as a conditional covenant where both parties had things to do and needed to abide by the terms. And there's a big if. In verse 5, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my possession. And that's opposed to the new covenant that all of us are under with Jesus Christ because that's an unconditional covenant. The the difference is, is that God applied every condition to Himself. He paid the price, He ratified it Himself, and He did not impose anything on us in return for receiving the benefits of the covenant. He did it all in Jesus Christ. That's the covenant that Jesus spoke of in Luke 22 where He took the cup and after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Hebrews 9, 15 says it this way, for this reason He is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, that's the one we're talking about here in Exodus, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Jesus Christ mediated the new covenant on our behalf without the if statement in there. If you do this, it's simply receive what I've already done. Back to the Israelites. We'll get to us in a second. God promises the Israelites a place in His kingdom, 
And he gives them a mission to be priests, a holy nation. They were to be his witnesses out in the world. They were called to show everyone what it means to love and to serve the living God, the one and only living God. However, their confidence in their own abilities and their actual performance rarely agreed with one another, as you read in the Old Testament so many times. But if you look at the text, you see the response of the Israelites when Moses tells them of this great thing that God has done and He wants them to be part of His kingdom. The people's response to God's invitation to keep His covenant, to follow Him always as His chosen people in verse 8 was to say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will do. And it was not just some of the people that were saying yes and more saying no, it was all the people saying, we will do. And their response, while being well-intentioned, was made in arrogance and a misplaced confidence in themselves instead of God. They thought they had it over, or they thought they had it all that they could do. And yet they proved over and over, as they already had in their wilderness wilderness wandering, excuse me, up to this point, that they could not and in many cases would not do as God commanded them. They were stiff-necked and they were obstinate, and they paid the price for it again and again. But God never forgot them or left them completely. Where there was repentance, there was restoration. When they would humble themselves before God, He would hear their cry and He would restore them. And ultimately, God solved the problem of sin that His people had in the only way possible. And that was by giving His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, as the payment for all sin. To be their Savior and the Savior for the entire world. So you see the three things, God's remembrance or reminder of His deliverance of His people, the invitation to be a part of His kingdom and live out His calling in their lives, and then the response of, yes, we will do, Lord. And so we ask, what do these things mean for us? Well, when we ask that question, the answers are largely the same. Or the the answer, the response is largely the same. But we have to understand that everything we have in our response and in our deliverance and in our mission, our life in the kingdom of God is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our deliverance is found in Him. Just as God saved His people exclusively on His own, every single person has been saved solely by the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no work for us to do in salvation because God has accomplished all on the cross. And hear what it says in Ephesians 2, but God being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. God has indeed saved all who would call upon Him in faith. But do we need a reminder too that we have been called to be God's chosen people? Yes, yes we do, because we were not a people. But in the salvation and the new life that we have received in Jesus Christ, we have been made a people. A people not of this world, but of God's kingdom. And you see in our text language that is similar to what Peter uses in in his first letter to describe us. 1 Peter 2, this is verses 9 and 10, says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now look back in our text in uh, Exodus 19. Hear what it says in verse 5. Now if you obey me and fully keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Here's the thing. Although the the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Do you see the similarities to the text? God called His people. Just then, or then, in the same way that He calls us now to be delivered by His own hand in our Lord Jesus Christ and to be His people, His kingdom, faithfully living as He called us to live. We've been called out of the world to be placed in God's kingdom, washed by the blood of Christ and forgiven of our sins and freed from its bondage for good. But like the Israelites of Moses' day longing for Egypt, We too can sometimes long for the old world of sin. 
Sometimes we wander back that way, thinking that it must be better than the struggles we face in the kingdom of God. But my friends, we have been called to something far greater than the world from which we came. We have been made a holy nation, a royal priesthood chosen by God and called to shine the light of Christ into a dark world corrupted and destroyed by sin. We have a higher purpose than the things of this world. We have a greater salvation in Jesus Christ than anything that this world could offer. And we have been shown a greater love by God than anything that we could possibly expect or imagine. Hear what it says in our New Testament lesson. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. Be reminded this morning of everything that God has done for you in Jesus Christ. Know that He absolutely loves you and has a plan for your life. Plans for good and not for evil. Remember that all things work together for good for those who love Him. It's not a promise that says the lives we have on earth are going to be easy. It's a promise that says that the eternity that comes after it is greater than anything we can comprehend or know while we walk on the earth right now. And it is as certain as the Scripture says that it is that Jesus Christ is Lord and that He will save all who call upon Him in faith. Trust in the Lord for your deliverance and eternity today. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and go forth then and be His witnesses as He Himself has called you to do. Live in His kingdom, obey His commandments. And the message for us this morning is to respond to God's Word and the promises we have in Christ in the affirmative, just as God's people did here, saying, we will do. But our response is not to be one of arrogance or ignorance thinking that we have the strength to do all on our own. Our response is one of confidence, knowing that we are imperfect, but that we are made perfect in our Lord Jesus Christ, trusting that even though we still struggle with our old nature and imperfection, that we do indeed have perfection before God, and we will see that perfection when we see the Lord face to face as He is. And we trust that we will do because God does these things in us and through us and that we go in His strength and not our own. When we say we will do, we know that God has already done. And so go, therefore, and live your lives in holiness and light instead of darkness and sin. Respond to God's call with an attitude of we will do in the knowledge that He has already done all things in Jesus Christ our Lord. And know the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in His plan for you and live your lives acting upon that faith in trust that He has placed in you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do um, praise Your name this morning and give thanks that You have called us out of darkness into Your light that You have made it available to us through the blood of Your Son, Jesus Christ, and that You simply require nothing of us other than to do what You called us to do, and that is believe and accept. Believe and accept and trust. And Lord, we pray that we would have that trust now and evermore. In Jesus' name, amen. As we respond to the Word of God, I invite you to stand as a congregation, and we are going to uh, confess what we believe this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven 
and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day He rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father, and He shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you treasure your people for Christ's sake and give us your commandments to guide our ways. Grant that we, redeemed by his blood, may do all he has spoken. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy God, send forth laborers to make known the gospel of your kingdom in Jesus Christ. Prosper the labors of pastors, missionaries, and all who labor for the gospel, that many may hear, believe, and praise you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. A righteous Father, from whom all fatherhood in heaven and earth is named, give it your grace to the fathers and sons of your church. Inspire them by your own example and the example of your beloved son to be perfectly united in faith, hope, and love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty Lord, turn the eyes of all who make, execute, and judge our laws to you, that they may receive wisdom and strength to faithfully carry out their duties. Lord, in your name. Here. Heavenly Father, your Son demonstrated his power over sin by healing every disease and affliction. Give healing to those in need, especially Chris, Tony, Diane, Steve, Robert, Luis, Joshua, Karen, Carla, Gerald, Barbara, Bob and Sharon, Linda, Wally, Joe, Willie, Lori, Faye, Dolores, Kathy, Val, Jerry, Dean, Reed, Joshua, Margo, Monica, Virginia, Pamela, Melody, our missions, and our serving in the military. Deliver them according to your gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. Most blessed Lord, through Moses you called a people to yourself, and from them you delivered up your own Son to be our Savior. By his sufferings and death, he has redeemed us sinners from our sins. By his resurrection, he has released us from the fear of death. Help us to live as your people, doing the good works for which we were created, and praying with confidence the petitions and supplications of our hearts. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The congregation may be seated, and we'll sing our hymn of the day. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's number 517. Trust and obey.
Let's stand and sing. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves and our time and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord. Almighty Father and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave by His glorious resurrection, open to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify Your glorious name, evermore praising You and saying, As I prepare the table for Holy Communion, I want to invite you to do uh, what Scripture calls upon us to do, and that is examine our hearts before we come to this table. And in that uh, vein, I would direct you to the front of your bulletin insert where there are five questions. And if you can answer those in the affirmative, I want you to come and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which He was betrayed, took bread and broke it. When He had given thanks, He broke it and gave it to His disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is My body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of Me. The same manner He took the cup, and when He had eaten and when He had given thanks, He gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in My blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray as our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As your hearts are prepared and as you were directed by our ushers, I invite you to come and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Let's stand and sing. Son, both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing our closing hymn this morning, number 511, Blessed Assurance.
Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.